by believing I could have been healed. My mind's eye thus purified would have been directed in some degree toward your truth, which abides forever and is indefectible. But just as it is commonly happens that a person who has experienced a bad physician is afraid of entrusting himself to a good one, so it was with the health of my soul. As we move into Augustine's secular career and into his teaching at Rome and in Milan, we will continue to see a struggling man coming to terms with what he is discerning within himself is actually what he is searching for. Um, I, we probably have all had various times in which we have had to reevaluate, am I actually happy? Am I actually doing the things that I really desire to be doing? And in those periods of reflection, it allows us to become a little bit more clear with ourselves about really where we are in life. And this is just part of a developmental cycle. This is something that everybody goes through. But Augustine goes through this at a particularly important part of his life in which he is evaluating not just, am I doing what I think that I need to be doing or am I happy with what I'm doing? But he's asking, what is the source of his discontent? Which I find quite interesting in this particular part of his writing. Because we first get a compare and contrast in this chapter. And by the way, the name of this chapter is really important because Secular Ambitions and Conflicts is, is what the name of this chapter is in this edited version of the book. The subtext of a lot of what goes on in this chapter, while you get a lot of stories in this, uh, in this chapter, which is a lot of fun, the subtext of it, though, is weighing and evaluating within Augustine's own mind, where and why is Augustine miserable? Because he is in the midst of trying to make some changes to his life, that's true, but he also has an exam two really good examples in this chapter of people who he highly looks up to, who he really relies on, who are living lives that are remarkably different than his, but that he desires something about those lives. And um, one of the people that is going to be a compare and contrast character in this chapter is Augustine's mother, Monica. The very beginning of this chapter had a really interesting description of Monica. Um, as, remember, after last chapter, um, Augustine leaves for Rome really um, uh, by secret and really against his mother's wishes. Um, and she is deeply hurt by this. But Monica actually uh, travels to Rome with Augustine and... Um, Augustine has this great description of the sort of um, wider culture's observance of religion and culture and politics, and Monica's very distinctly different observance of really, let's just say, um, classical Christian um, observances of these various things. One thing that I really enjoyed was Monica's... Um, observance of um, making food for the deceased saints um, and dropping it by uh, dropping it by their various graves and I really liked how um, Monica was really temperate with her wine consumption Augustine uh, writes about this as if this is something very strange but it also is something in which um, it belies an underlying characteristic of Monica of really holiness. Um, there's this great line that Augustine writes about uh, Monica that um, she desired devotion, not popularity, which is, by the way, really key sentence for this chapter because Augustine was not there yet. But Monica's uh, relationship to um, the heritage of the Christian tradition is, 
and likewise her observance of when in uh, merrymaking or when in social situations with others, she would sip some wine um, out of honor for the person who was providing the party, but she in no way was over-consuming or even getting close to it. And there's something going on with this description that I think is something really important. Because the rest of the chapter, notice how Augustine is a slave to his passions. And what I mean, what I mean by passions is when Augustine uses the word passions, he's using the word passions in the Greek and Latin sense of the word passions of the time period. Passions are afflictions of the flesh. It's those things that draw you away from the good path. If you were a Neoplatonist, as we're going to get to next chapter, if you were a Neoplatonist, the passions of the body are distractions from the, the life of the mind. If you were a Manichaean, like Augustine was for a good portion of his growing up life, the passions are a distraction from the spiritual. And in a way, Augustine is setting up Monica as someone who has mastered, in some ways, um, control over her passions, and instead is subjecting them to her devotion to God. And it's an example, or a counterexample, of Augustine's own life, because for the rest of the chapter, Augustine is going to struggle mightily with his bodily passions. And one of those things comes up right after the description of Monica. So, Monica, in her holy devotion of life, uh, praying for Augustine, and in a lot of ways, um, still steering Augustine back towards the Catholic faith, um, Augustine then runs headlong into another character that he sees and really desires to imitate, which is the Bishop Ambrose. Um, <laughs> There's a, a funny little practical um, a sort of thing going on here where Augustine really desires to sit down and pour out his heart to Ambrose, but simply couldn't find time because the bishop was so busy. <laughs> um, as someone who is professional clergy, I sympathize with Ambrose. <laughs> that uh, I imagine that Ambrose would have loved to sit down with Augustine. Um, but especially with the responsibilities of being a bishop in Milan of that particular time period, um, understandably, Ambrose had some stuff he's got to deal with. But that did not prevent the fact that Ambrose was ministering to Augustine in another way, which was he was opening up Augustine's mind to the scriptures. Another thing that Augustine was, uh, was slave to, if we remember in previous chapters, was Augustine has a real passion for beauty. And one of those passions for beauty, he has his oration. He loves oration. He was a professor of oration. Um, speech. He was a professional speech writer. We see that come up in this chapter, by the way, when he, um, when he gives a speech uh, in honor of the emperor. But he is a professional speech writer. He has pupils that he teaches rhetoric to. But Ambrose employs his rhetoric in a way that begins to break down the defenses that Augustine has built up against the Bible. Because, if you remember, one of Augustine's main complaints about the Bible is that it was rudimentary. It was, uh, in some ways, archaic. And, in fact, he points out something that I think his honesty is breathtaking in this case. He said that there are portions of the scriptures that are reprehensible on literal reading. I hope you caught that, because so often in contemporary time periods, people bring up that, like, aren't there portions of the Bible that are just, like, completely immoral um, or are just reprehensible uh, on its face? Guess what? Augustine was pointing this stuff out in the 400s. That means that let's say, the Christian tradition and likewise um, the Jewish tradition has been obviously aware of these issues, and we've had to ask the question as to how we're dealing with those issues. Augustine actually gives us a little bit of an insight as to how Ambrose did it, which is that when Ambrose runs across these passages, Ambrose explains them in a spiritually related manner. This was a very normal thing when you run across um, passages that on their literal reading, 
could under no circumstances be read in a way that would make sense given the wider um, attestation of Scripture, such as a kind of famous one that comes up over and over again when the Israelites uh, were commanded to eliminate people groups uh, from the ancient Near East. Um, the question over whether you read that literally or not um, is actually been something that has been a live question since the 300s of interpretation. In fact, it probably uh, probably a uh, 200s because um, our early commentators, such as Origin of Alexandria, um, actually uh, explained some of these things as there are portions of Scripture that it is not spiritually healthy to read literally, and. It, when we run across those passages, Origen's approach would have been to read it allegorically. Augustine um, takes from Ambrose's exposition of Scripture uh, that Ambrose uh, explains it for a more spiritual manner, which could be allegory, but it could also be that, um, that uh, Ambrose explains it metaphorically um, in a kind of bigger um, sort of cosmological sense rather than a particular sense. Anyway. All of that to say is that Ambrose, in his way of dealing with these hard passages of Scripture, opens up the Scriptures to Augustine as it's not simply these rudimentary texts that are these kind of archaic or barbaric texts that Augustine had trouble with. Instead, uh, the way that Ambrose was explaining it was much more amenable to how um, Augustine's own sort of um, moral sense is activated in some of these cases. Which again, Augustine has a very strong moral sense. It's just that when Augustine's moral sense runs into conflict with his passions, that's where Augustine's uh, internal conflict is really roiling. And as we see, Augustine desiring to, to, uh, to um, uh, be like Ambrose in some ways, or desiring, um, as he says, uh, he really did desire the Catholic faith and preferred it over other things, he still was not ready to really, he was not ready to really give himself over. That passage that we read at the very beginning of this chapter, that um, when you've entrusted yourself to a bad doctor, it's hard to give yourself over to a good one. I think it's a great way of describing where Augustine is in this whole chapter. Because even though we have Monica and we have, and we have Ambrose, these are good paragons of virtue, of faith, we then have Augustine's own self-reflection over a couple of interesting circumstances. Before he gives the oration in honor of the emperor, there was a drunk man that Augustine encountered. And he has this short but really important reflection over happiness. Now, important thing here. Happiness does not mean, in this case, does not mean simple pleasure. It does not mean uh, that I am simply pleasure-seeking. When Augustine uses the word happiness, he's using it in the philosophical sense. Happiness is not just an emotional feeling of elation. Happiness is a holistic equilibrium of being at peace with the world. This is the philosophic sort of uh, explanation of the word happiness, which would have been very readily used, and probably is the way that Augustine uses happiness most often within his writings, is the philosophic use of the word happiness. At peace and at equilibrium with the world. Again, your passions are under control, and you have a right relationship to the world. In this way, happiness, by the way, is really closely related to justice. Um, in which we have a right relationship to the world as it comes to rights and wrongs, truth and faults. So, in the way that Augustine uses the word happiness, we need to have that in our, in our mind. He's not talking about simply being emotionally happy about a situation. Happiness, in this case, is being at peace with everything. And uh, notice that when he talks about his anxiety, his deep anxiety, but then looks at this drunk guy who is merrymaking, things like that. He said that this person is at, at, at in some ways, happy and, and, and is living pleasurefully with the world in ways that really are way more practical than the ways that I'm doing it. 
Um, looking at this man, if you were to ask this man if he was happy, he probably would say yes. Whereas Augustine says, if you were to ask me if I was happy in his, all of his anxiety around his oration, he would say no. But Augustine says, here's the key. If you were to ask me, would I trade places with this man? I would say no. And he said, why is that that I would say no? Why is it that I could look at this man and say that this man is far more happy than I am. He's used a lot less money to be able to become happy. He's not as educated as me. He's not as um, politically in vogue as I am. And yet he's happy and I'm not. Why is that? Well, Augustine then continues on to talk about one of his friends from his hometown, Olypius. And Olypius is a character that um, Augustine, again, he's grown up with. He knows who Olypius is. He's been friends with Olypius. And the key thing about Olypius is that Olypius also has a very strong moral sense about him, which is what attracted Augustine, Augustine to him. But Olypius has control of his passions, but Augustine doesn't. Um, the, the discussion about marriage with Olypius and Augustine. Um, Olypius, um, in discussing about whether to get married or not, Olypius basically swears off marriage um, for the reason, interesting reason, that um, whereas Augustine continuously has this problem um, with his, um, really, with, with sexual promiscuity, is, is, is what uh, Augustine has, has trouble with, Olypius, on the other hand, does not struggle with this. He's really content to live as a single person and to live in right relationship to the world because Olypius saw marriage as a, perhaps a, a barrier to being able to live in the right relationship to the world. Now, again, Neoplatonism would also agree with this um, in that um, the best sort of relationship, um, the best sort of love relationship to the world is friendship and marriage there's this kind of baggage behind marriage uh, when when procreation happens um, for the Neoplatonists. Are we are we uh, cutting against our own grain by again almost a Manichaean uh, sort of um, sympathizing here? Of are we doing something physical and distracting ourselves from the spiritual, which is how Neoplatonists would discuss this. Well, Augustine. Um, fights back on this. And Augustine actually says that the reason why he argues with Olypius about this is not for any good reason, but to alleviate his own guilt about his own sin, something that he struggled with. I think that there's a, an appropriate parallel to make here with alcoholism, actually. Um, whereas Augustine deeply struggles with something that Olypius does not struggle with, it highlights the fact that there are addiction types of um, activities that affect some person far, far differently than someone else does. For Olypius, um, sexuality was not a struggle for Olypius. Um, it was more, again, there was a more balanced, a, a very more, a much more self-controlled uh, approach to sexuality. For Augustine, it was exactly the opposite extreme. Augustine self-confessedly did not have control over himself. He did not have self-control as it came to his sexuality. And I think that I think that there's something to be said for those who struggle with alcoholism. Whereas for someone who is an alcoholic, their ability to not continue drinking after that first sip um, is Actually, it's actually an impossibility in a lot of ways. Whereas, at least for me personally, I don't struggle that way. Uh, whereas I can have a drink of something and then not, and then and then it not be a problem. But again, that does not mean that that can be an affliction for someone else. And so, in in the same way, um, I think that we we should treat Augustine um, and Olypius as examples of. Um, a good reminder that there are struggles that people have that we might never we might never understand, but that we are we still need to be very aware of, and that comes to a head when Augustine wants to pursue his ambition of being more politically active and more involved with the and more involved with the powers that be, 
And in order to do that, Augustine has to have some um, claim to nobility. And in order for that to happen, Augustine has got to marry up. He's got to, he's got to marry up to nobility. And in that way, we have uh, really the, the, one of the more tragic situations in Augustine's life, which is the separation uh, between him and the Carthaginian woman, who he had been in relationship for 14 years up to that point. And, uh, and self-confessedly, Augustine was very, again, happy with that relationship. This is a difficult one, because... Um, for our modern, again, for, uh, for our contemporary time period, this seems, this makes no sense. If you loved someone, why not stay with the person? It's just not our culture, though. Um, Augustine would have had no access, no ability to climb the class ladder or social ladder if he did not marry into nobility. And it seems, again, Monica sets up this marriage um, with uh, with a uh, girl who is in the noble rankings, uh, because that's what Augustine's desire was. Monica, had, you know, more or less, perhaps not being super thrilled um, about uh, the Carthaginian woman being a bl uh, being a block between him and again the view of marriage as being again a marriage. It's kind of like anything. What, 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 when you have someone who you're, uh, what, when you have a parent who is displeased with the way that their children are living, and then they have an opportunity to maybe affect their children to live in a more virtuous manner, that could be going on here. But I think the description, more importantly, again in the subtext, is that Augustine did not have control over himself. He was still a slave to his ambitions. And when the Carthaginian woman was sent home and swears to live in fidelity to Augustine, even though she's going to leave, leaves the child um, that uh, they had together with Augustine uh, to be able to be raised in nobility, um, the struggles that Augustine has after the woman leaves, I think, is betraying the wider theme of this chapter which is that even when the woman leaves and Augustine is pledged in suit to someone, Augustine still seeks out other extramarital relationships to satisfy his desires. Alepius and Augustine in this chapter are almost polar opposites in this very parallel issue. And it's highlighting for us the, the plodding path of Getting better and getting worse. The sort of middle section of Augustine's journey, and not uh, not necessarily in his life, but sort of the the uh, middle section in his change fully out of adolescence into young adulthood, into career, into um, all of the various pressures that come on with that, and a deep question about truth. What is true about the world? And how is my experience of the world showing me that there is truth that I'm seeking, but maybe seeking in the wrong ways? In summation of this chapter, we have a lot of stories in this chapter. In fact, one of the stories we didn't get to was, um, was Olypius and his um, false accusation of, uh, of stealing from the blacksmiths. But... That, by the way, is a, is a showing that, you know, Alepius was falsely accused um, of stealing from the blacksmiths and was justified in the end by someone who could prove that he was not, he was not a thief. Um, there's a way in which Augustine sees and understands that there are virtuous people he wishes to be like in his life. Monica, Ambrose, to a lesser extent, Alepius. And that in those ways, Augustine is trying to get square with himself. Why is it that I, almost in the, in the, in the language of St. Paul, why is it that the good that I want to do, I can't perform it? And the evil that I know is bad for me, that's just what I do. Um, it's a struggle that I think is very real, that I think is very honest from Augustine. And once again, for Augustine's audience that he's writing this for, it's a bishop of the church 
writing about his earlier life to his people about his struggles. And there's a way in which I wonder if there is a little bit of a sympathetic writing that is going on here, where Augustine is looking at his people and saying, I struggle with this. And here is where I have struggled. Here's where I've been. Here's how God has been there through the whole thing. And here's how life is not simple. Life is not clean. Life is messy. Sin is messy. Um, and that there is still redemption through the whole thing. I think that secular ambition and the confusing conflict of Augustine's moral compass and his lifestyle are starting to really butt heads, push each other around. And when we get to his entrance into Neoplatonism, it's going to find a mental way of being able to work itself out in ways that might be a little bit of a bridge, another bridge being built between where he was and his slow movement towards Christianity.